The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. What does it really mean when people say they've seen the light? Did shepherds really hear choirs of angels on the night Jesus was born? And what do our limited physical senses of sight and sound reflect about a much more profound spiritual awareness we possess? Welcome to this week's edition of NDE Radio, brought to you by IANS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. Light and music are the vibrations most often referenced by those who've experienced an NDE. And likewise, those who've experienced distressing NDEs often speak of an absence of light, of being cut off from the light. Some scientists have said they hear echoes of the word of God when they detect the background vibrations at the outer edge of the Big Bang universe. But these references to heavenly light and sound are not new. They go back to the roots of faith and the spiritual insights of many religions. Our guest today is James Bean, a comparative religion scholar and a book reviewer, author, public speaker, broadcaster with a broad familiarity with the global religions and spiritual traditions. He's been involved with public radio, Radio for Peace International, the community radio movement, Wisdom Radio, and is an independent producer currently creating programs for several stations. James also is a scholar and practitioner of Surat Shabda Yoga, an ancient form of meditation from India. And uh, this form of meditation is about the union of the soul with the inner light and sound of God. James, welcome to NDE Radio. Hey, how's it going? Well, on to the subject. Um, <clears throat> Christians describe Jesus as light from light. And I, I know one of your favorite Western texts is the Gospel of Thomas, where Jesus says we have come from the light, from the place where the light came into being by itself and there are many other religious references sacred to uh, sacred light as well. And so I'm hoping you'll give us a brief overview of light as a description of God and heaven and what people see when they have an NDE. Yes, uh, the, the divine light or visions of light or the light motif turns up everywhere in in all of the world religions and mystical writings including christian mystics and uh the new testament itself and gnostic gospels and uh people that, that tend to ha have had a near death experience or are mystically inclined and meditate such as myself although i also had a, a kind of near death experience a, a long time ago uh, folks like us tend to notice you know these passages and go ah see light uh, if your eye is single your 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 whole body will be filled with light uh, yes and we notice these passages but for people who are non experiencers they see that those as just metaphor for I intellectually understand something or something like that. And they don't really see that dimension. So we basically, and this is kind of a spiritual principle, uh, whatever level we're at, we tend to see through the, that, those spectacles and our level of understanding what we notice in scriptures or what we're attracted to will tend to match our current state of consciousness, if you will. And so for the mystically inclined, you know, we, we see all of these references to divine light in the world scriptures and go, and go, hey, that's like a near-death experience, or St. Paul got caught up to the third heaven, hey there, <laughs> you know, hmm. uh, had an uh, out-of-body experience. Um, and uh, so these, these references are, are everywhere. Uh, and it basically is, uh, a, a human, it just communicates that human beings, while alive, can tune into something of the heavens for those who have the eyes to see. It is possible, uh, basically through sensory deprivation type techniques, uh, prayer, meditation, uh, being in a cave for a very long time, you know, d just some sort of way to transcend our normal waking state of consciousness and five sense perception, to step out of that for a minute, uh, be still and know that I am God, to quote the book of Psalms. If we can just enter that stillness, uh, it is possible for human beings to see divine light, 
uh, in the Hindu Upanishads. Uh, it, it describes uh, firefly-like lights and sparkles and stars, and uh, there are many references to divine light in uh, in all of these religions. Uh, but it's not necessarily something that most people would would uh, experience or would have encountered. So it all seems probably pretty strange to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. But it, it's, <clears throat> it's there. It's like infrared or ultraviolet light or radio waves. If you have the right kind of receiver, <laughs> you, you can you can tune in other right. uh, frequencies. <clears throat> Well, I, I noticed in uh, an article you wrote for Inner Tapestry that you refer to these fireflies, stars, various colors, and other visions of light that people can have through meditating. So, right. how how far can you go with meditation? What what's your uh, personal experience with that? And and also, uh, what are the mystics' uh, reports about that sort of thing? Meditation. Uh, or uh, and that word goes by other terms in different traditions. I like the Syriac Eastern Christian tradition of Mesopotamia. They use the term pure prayer. Others might call it contemplation or the silence, uh, just entering into the silence. Uh, people have historically gone quite far. There are a few mystics that I think have pretty much gone as far as one can go, even further than many near-death experiencers. Uh, but typically, meditators don't get to that point. You know, we sort of dip our toe into the great beyond through meditation. So it's a more gradual approach uh, than a near-death experience where you're, you know, your car is wrapped around a telephone pole and you're flung out of your body and get there in a hurry. Yes. Uh, but you can, through meditation, tune into those same realms. In fact, when I was very young, since this is a program about near-death experiences, <laughs> when I was about 19, I mean, I've always been a person of faith and, and prayer and, and um, solitude. And uh, one day I was so caught up in prayer and chant, what I now would call meditation, for hours. And I actually entered into that realm that I would now call a near-death experience. I was... Uh, Caught, you know, I was outside of my body uh, in a realm that is pure love, absolute uh, love. And um, there was a being that uh, was in front of me, I noticed. And I, I don't really have an opinion uh, as to what kind of being. It was a pure being of love and light. But I, I, it didn't look like Jesus. It didn't look like an angel. I don't have a label for the, the being as such, other than it was very tall, and I couldn't make out the face. Hmm. And since then, I've read a bunch of near-death books, and that has come up with other people, that they couldn't see the face of the heavenly being. So there are a few other people that have reported that particular uh, aspect. Uh, and it was just this blissful encounter just in this pure realm of love. And I remember te- telepathically exchanging a few words, if you will, with this heavenly being. And at the time, I, I, I said, basically, I'm just paraphrasing myself. I, you know, this is awesome. I want to do this every day. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to come back again and again. But the, the telepathic reply was like, no, you won't be experiencing this for a while. And I kind of thought, nah, come on. <laughs> we can do this. <laughs> but the being was right. Uh, but it was just this incredible baptism of love, if you will, to where you where, where love is like thick, the, an atmosphere of love, like the ocean, and you didn't, mm-hmm. you, one doesn't realize there is that much love that exists. I, I had the similar experience when I was uh, as a chaplain attending a, a death, and uh, it was very unusual because I've been at many deaths, but this this time the room almost filled was like a a golden honey that you couldn't you couldn't really perceive it as visually as as gold but it just felt that way and uh, was i think it had a lot to do with god's love for this particular person or this per- particular person's love for god a powerful powerful uh, presence of of and honey is about the only analogy i can think of to to explain what the what the atmosphere in the room felt like <clears throat> yes yeah, that there 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 can be that 
in addition to a component of light or sound, a sense of awe, wonder, pure love, a uh, kind of bliss, or what in India would be the word is ananda, uh, just mm-hmm. pure heavenly bliss. You're you're blessed. You're blessed. It's it's interesting to think of. You know, we talk about light and love as I, I mean, there's a alliteration there, but and the, 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 the words are used almost interchangeably in poetry, but people don't generally think of love as a physical manifestation the way they do light. And yet there there seems to be some sort of uh, physical uh, nature to love. Yeah, it's certainly a perception that people feel, and I, I like that language of Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection, um, practicing the presence of God, because that term presence, that I think that, for me, that that's a, a word that that describes it. Mm. What uh, what do some of the other religions? Uh, how do they how do they interpret love and light? Well, Rumi poetry certainly does that just about better than anything else, except for Kabir poetry. Kabir is my favorite poet, but Rumi. Uh, and many are drawn to Rumi poetry in the Western world, and they they may not exactly know why, uh, because uh, they're they're just drawn to his loving presence and radiance, and they're encountering a, a, a Sufi mystic. And for many people, that's probably the first time they've ever encountered someone like that, who is a mystically inclined person. So they're just drawn to Rumi poetry because Rumi uh, represents this interesting way of looking at the cosmos. That that is very much about experiencing God in this life, uh, and so you know people are drawn to Rumi like moths to the flame, perhaps for that <laughs> reason. Uh, he's kind of a connection, uh, uh, and for others it might be Kabbalah or Gnosticism or Sant Mod or some other school of mystics where these secrets get shared with people openly without any fear of prosecution or persecution, <laughs> where <laughs> where this sort of thing is accepted and and uh, encouraged. In fact, I think I heard maybe on one of your radio shows that uh, w- when you were interviewing Barks, perhaps that uh, Rumi is the best-selling poet in this country. Yeah, is that still yeah. true? That's still true. Yeah, I looked into that, and I, I, not just even uh, in a specialty category like spiritual poetry, but just just poetry as a category. Uh, they say that Rumi is the most uh, widely read poet, and he's certainly quoted a lot on the internet. I, I can I can personally say that I've seen you know tens of thousands of Rumi quotes online. So he is definitely very popular. Uh, Rumi presents God as the beloved. Uh, sometimes he calls God the friend or a companion, but the the common Sufi term for God is is the beloved. And so it is a divine romance that is his model, as opposed to uh, other models of a, a frightening God, so you're guilty and you want to re- alleviate guilt. For Rumi, God is a love affair, so he's far beyond uh, guilt and, and you know, uh, just trying to squeak by with minimum participation. Uh, it's a divine romance. If you read Rumi, so it's a bit like Odes of Solomon or or Psalms of Solomon or or uh, the Psalms, you know, uh, God as companion, mm-hmm. uh, God as friend, God as uh, uh, as uh, beloved, object of, of one's love, and that's also quite universal with uh, the mystics. So the more love, the more God, and the more the more experience of heaven. But all mm-hmm. of those things, I think, are intertwined. There's a um, a lot of popular music I've found. If you just took the name of the woman out or the man and put in put in God, would work just as well as any uh, gospel song in terms of uh, talking about love. In Absolutely. Yeah, that's very true. And Deepak Chopra did the opposite. He uh, put out a book of his own uh, paraphrases of Rumi poetry and turned it into sort of an erotic love poetry. So he went in the opposite direction with that. <laughs> <laughs> Leonard Cohen does that with his music a lot, too. He had a lot of interplay between the, the hedonistic and the sensual and, and the spiritual. Yep, yep, that theme, uh, Kabir poetry, um, Eastern poet mystics, especially the Sufis, uh, 
uh, Urdu poetry of uh, Pakistan and Central Asia, India, uh, they're all very much uh, in that tradition of the lover and the beloved. And it also turns up in in the Western world, too, uh, John of the Cross. I put him in that category of having a religion that's cultivating lovers of the beloved. Mm-hmm. Uh, John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, some of those medieval uh, saints you know, had that same approach. And some of them even met Sufis in Spain, so maybe there's even a direct connection there. <laughs> Right. Well, Spain was a great crossroads for those cultural uh, exchanges. Right. Um, they, 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 something was going on with them. You have all these yeah. amazing medieval mystics. and uh, very I think a lot of that was facilitated as well by um, uh, the Templars and their um, first their experiences in the Middle East and Jerusalem. And then later on, they um, had uh, trade routes with Turkey and the East and... Uh, and I think a lot of ideas crossed, uh, crossed back and forth as well. Oh, yes. Everyone loved books, and we're swapping books in, in uh, Turkey and, and, you know, uh, yeah, Christians and Jewish and, and Sufis. Uh, quite often it enjoyed the same books, and we're into, into mystical books <laughs> and shared ideas. And so, yeah, the beloved, I, for me, I, I like terms like, for God, I like uh, the term Anurag Sagar, which is from India, which means ocean of love. I, I like that term ocean of love as a description of God, mm. and it kind of resonates with my own personal experience uh, and seems to turn up again and again in, in different cultures. And, and Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, is that theme of the beloved as well. Mm. You put together uh, quotes from Jesus in a sermon on the light, which I really sure. like. The Sermon um, on the Light. <laughs> um, you don't happen to have that with you, do you? I do. I have it right in front of me, as a matter of fact. Uh, would you like to read some uh, some of it? Um, I, I could, I, I yeah. First explain what it is, and then, uh, and, and, uh, and then read some of it for us. Yeah, I put together all of these sayings of Jesus taken from the New Testament, Gospel of Thomas, Peace to Sophia, which is another Gnostic uh, book, and some other things from Egypt, and put them all together. And notice that it, it they all fit together really well, and it seemed more like a sermon on the light, which is how we would imagine Jesus would speak. You, you know, it wouldn't be a case of someone standing up in a crowd saying, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Thank you very much, everyone. See you next Sunday. Uh, it would be a, a discourse of some sort. And that's what this feels like. And uh, since these are all real passages, you know, hey, you know, it just makes uh, it pr- perfect sense to see what happens when you read this and, and what your reaction is. So I just call this the Sermon on the Light. Trust in me. Look to the living one while you are alive, lest you die and seek to see him and be unable to see. Understand what the great light is. I am the light that is over all things. I am all. From me all came forth, and to me all attained. Split a piece of wood, I am there. Lift up the stone, and you will find me there. I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will not be walking in the dark, but will have the light of life. Walk while you have the light, so darkness won't overpower you. Those who walk in the dark don't know where they're going. Since you have the light, believe in the light, and you will become children of the light. I will give you what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no hand has felt, and what has never occurred to the human mind. And there's a, I'm going to fast forward a bit. Uh, if your eye be single, your whole body shall be full of light. When I have gone to the light, preach to all of the world and say to them, do not cease seeking day or night and do not let yourselves relax until you find the mysteries of the kingdom of light which will purify you and make you into pure light and lead you into the kingdom of the light. So I just find all of these sayings to go together really well. Mm-hmm. And it it is coming from that esoteric tradition. Uh, and and I, the light motif, as I have under, uh, understood it and studied it in, in these texts, including the the Christian and even Eastern Orthodox uh, mystical traditions, uh, their goal is to, while alive during this lifetime, 
see divine light or visions of light in their time of prayer or contemplation. It's kind of a secretive thing because no one wants to brag about where they're at and, you know, turn it into a very carnal and ego inflated sort of thing. So it's kept a, a secret on uh, Mount Athos and Greece and, you know, in Christian monasteries and, and in other traditions too. They don't really, they're, this is sort of like the secret teachings that no one talks about. Because it's one, it's sort of far out sounding, like you, have, you can have visions of heaven and they'll come and lock you away. Or there was a time when uh, they would lock you away for such talk. And two, you know, it's a way to get persecuted and, and the Roman legions can, will come and bad things will happen and your, your funding will be cut off. And, and so uh, <laughs> there are real good reasons to kind of keep the, the secret teachings kind of under one's hat. Uh, as it were, but but this is very much uh, the goal of so many mystics. Uh, is it Simeon? Is Simeon, the new theologian, who's actually an Eastern Orthodox uh, saint, pretty much recognized by everyone, even the Catholic Church, uh, who said uh, that uh, true Christians uh, are those who see the light of the Holy Trinity. That was his language for it. So that's his definition of a Christian, <laughs> you know, to mm. see the light, literally. And in the monasteries and the contemplative uh, tradition, uh, east to west, uh, that is one of the goals, is to actually behold divine light. It's seen as a way to uh, cleanse your soul, to to use in Eastern terminology, you know, get lo- lower your karma, you know, get rid of some of your karma, um, it, or lighten the load, as it were. And so their goal is to see as much of heaven as possible during this life through meditation, and and people become, uh, they know the way back to that level again, uh, so that in the next world, they can continue their journey. You know, you're tethered to the light during life, and so you'll go to the light in the beyond. Mm. That's one of their goals. I think that's almost a paraphrase from a saying in the Gospel of Philip, you know, find the light now and you'll continue on with the light later. Right. Now, St. John of the Cross talked about the dark night of the soul and uh, going through darkness to get to light. And uh, one of the um, one of the things that gets reported from time to time in a near-death experience is that people have that experience as well, and sometimes they're terrified by it. Uh, sometimes they just have the dark experience, and then by the time they might be getting to the light, they suddenly find themselves back in their own bodies. But um, right. there's a there's, there are uh, spiritual traditions that speak of a dark place that you journey through as well, aren't there? Right, and in the path that I follow, which is Sant Mat, um, they they have uh, these heavens mapped out and. There are dark voids, dark crooked tunnels. Um, and there is a there's something called Mahasun, which is the great void, and so you'll be seeing lights or visions of light go through a, a whirlpool cave vortex, and then you'll come to this place of pure darkness, and you want to get through that and onto very bright light, you know, on the other side. And so uh, yes, even in the heavens. Uh, for people that have had visions of light, you still may encounter a, a, a layer of darkness. It's kind of like astronomy. I think astronomy and mysticism go together so well. Mm. Kind of we had a um, movie just come out recently called Gravity, which uh, if it's still playing in the theaters, I would recommend to people because it gives you that feeling of being lost in the darkness. Of course, uh, you you can see the earth and the stars and the, the sun and so forth, but the vastness of that darkness and your being lost and out of control floating through it is a, is a powerful image for um, a distressing NDE as well. Right, yes. Uh, yep, for, the, for the, the, the person of faith, yep, there's God with you in the darkness, but... Mm-hmm. Uh, Yes, by yourself as a little tiny dot and a big giant cosmos uh, can seem pretty lonely. <laughs> Very lonely, and I think loneliness is the uh, probably loneliness is more the op- opposite of uh, light than than uh, darkness. 
but maybe the two are just as parallel as light and love. Darkness and loneliness are parallel as well. Yeah, darkness, loneliness, or separation, just isolation. I had a, a woman send me a description of a dream she had, which was very much like a near-death experience. And I, I read part of it on um, uh, the show the uh, a couple w- week or two ago. But she described it being in this place that was created by light. She picks a flower and and then thinks, oh, now this flower is going to die. But she realizes that the flower and everything that uh, that she sees in this in this spiritual garden is the product of light. And all she does is places the flower back down on the ground, and it it it, it it's back attached to the source again. Right. Yes, I've seen some of those myself, and 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 um, mystics. Uh, well, in India, the symbol of the lotus. Uh, lotuses are used in the poetry of some mystics to describe uh, flower, heavenly flowers, and in other realms, astral gardens, if you will. Mm-hmm. The garden is also a, um, of course, a place that people love to go to when they love the sun. You know, on this earth, but uh, many people who had near-death experiences also describe beautiful, uh, supernal gardens with. Uh, um, beautiful flowers, and um, there are uh, there's that connection between light and life as well. Yes, nature. Um, yep, plants deriving their life from from the sun. Yeah, it's, it's as as above, so below. It's just a different. It's a parallel. I think. I, I mean, that's the way I read it. Yes, the best things of this world are are have parallels in 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 higher regions. Even some of the rituals of the world religions too, like Diwali and Christmas and Yule and Solstice are you know the darkest time of the year. People are celebrating with light, trying to make the darkness go away and be of good cheer on uh, at the coldest time of the year. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Diwali, the Hindu uh, festival of lights, and uh, Hanukkah and Christmas and Solstice. Soon to come to our neighborhood. Sure. <laughs> all of that, all of that, also tied to to pagan practices of worshiping the sun and right, and cutting those. a tree down and sure. taking taking yeah. it inside your house and putting lights on it. Or it used to be candles a long time ago. It must have burned down. A lot of houses must have burned down. <laughs> I, I think so. Uh, yeah. Before we uh, run out of time, James, uh, tell tell um, my audience um, a little about the shows that you do and um, what you're doing currently. I know you're doing a terrific thing on the yoga of sound and. Next week, you and I are going to be talking about sound. Uh, the sound way we've been talking about a, light today. Yes, yeah, sound uh, and light. Uh, how, how can how can they find out more about what you've written and and uh, what you've um, what radio shows you've done? If they just go to my website, spiritualawakeningradio.com, dot uh, there'll be links to articles, blogs, and. Uh, you can spend the rest of your life there. <laughs> you know, there's, I, I believe in websites that have links that just go on forever, almost eternally, uh, where you can read blogs and uh, and listen to shows, read articles. Where do you think people should? Um, I mean, if somebody came to you and said, "I want to know more about the light," how should they apply their time to reading, to meditation, to um, well, some people turn to drugs. I mean, what what would your advice be? My advice is to send me an email, and 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 not just me, but just someone who is on a spiritual path that deals with light, to talk to that living person, because you can get lost in a book. You know, you may get some things, and but not other things. And so, uh, a living person, whoever it is, who's into this. They will be able to talk, guide, direct, and they'll be much more alive than a than a book. Uh, books are good too. I'm, I've got lots of books in my house, but just that there's just a connection with with other people on the path uh, of light will, I think, be uh, make it a faster journey, an easier journey. To someone. Um, should have a teacher, in other words, or at least well, a, yeah, a teacher a, a or someone who knows a teacher. Sort. Yeah, I, I know teachers, and so I could easily direct someone. 
Um, so, yeah, I think that personal connection probably is more significant than anything else. Just someone who, uh, whether they're a, a teacher or they just are friends with a teacher who, or who knows a teacher and who's familiar with the, with the practice, uh, will so, be able to direct someone. So give them your, um, uh, your, uh, website address again. Yeah, that would be spiritual awakening radio, all as one word, dot com. All right. And well, listen, uh, we'll it. continue this next week, James. The sound of the world religions. Uh, the inner, sound, yes. Yeah, in uh, Buddhism, in Hinduism, and Christianity, too. Excellent. That will be our next week's NDE Radio. And uh, as I said, James will be tackling the equally fascinating topic of sacred sound, the music of heaven. My thanks to James Bean for today's edition of IAN's NDE Radio. For more information about IANS, our services, and news about near-death experience, please go to our website at iands.org. And join us next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern, for more NDE Radio. Thanks for listening. <laughs>